Father, we humble our hearts and um, are just so blessed to be together worshiping you. What, what a picture, what an experience of what our eternity may be like. All of our hearts united in one under the lordship of Jesus who has conquered every foe, who gives every blessing. And Lord, we worship you this morning. Bless the preaching of your word. Allow um, every sin to be forgiven, that your spirit might speak, that we might receive it. Lord, that we would be a people who are marked as those who do your word, not just those who listen, but who listen and obey. Give us your Holy Spirit for that task. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in Romans chapter 15 today, and, um, and I was going to try to sort of finish up the book of Romans and, and do a lot of text, two chapters. I decided, you know, we'll split it in half, and, um, and we'll save all the greetings and, and that sort of thing for, for next week. Paul has been working really hard in this, um, in this book to give to the Roman church something that they desperately need. They need a sense of unity. They, they need a sense of togetherness. And, and it's something that be, because of the city that they live in and the culture that they live in, um, the culture can't give it to them. They were just, there were too many people who were different, who were coming from different quarters. They would all come to church together. They would be a part of the same body. Well, some people had come to faith because of Peter's example, so very sort of Jewish, Christian, um, and, and they were together on all of their holidays, on what they ate, what they didn't eat. They were together as Christians. But then there were those people who were Greeks, um, and, and they had no idea about the Jewish culture, but they saw Jesus as sort of this champion of all the gods, the god of war, the god of messen messengers, the, the, you know, all these different gods, and they saw Jesus as sort of the one true her heroic who, who, could, who could actually redeem mankind, and they had almost nothing in common with the Jewish Christians. Then there were the slave Christians, those Christians who were not free, they were bond servants. They uh, were placed underneath the authority of someone else's home, and they had a, a culture all unto themselves. So here were all of these people, but they were all coming to church together. And uh, they had a struggle. They had a struggle on, uh, there was some massive culture wars going on. And it's not unlike today. It's not unlike today. Paul's trying to give this gift to them. He's, he's trying to tell them that they're one people. Hey, you guys, yes, you're different. That's okay, but you're all one people. You're one people who are different. There are many different body parts, but it's the same body. And he's telling them that they have one source, one God. And uh, the book of Romans teaches us that it is the Holy Spirit that's binding the people together in their spiritual tasks, but also in their spiritual gifts. Just one source. And of course, Paul's trying to tell them also, they all have one task. Even though they're coming from all over the place, they're coming together as one people, they're coming together with one God, one source, one spirit, and they all have one task. And Paul, as he's concluding the book, is is trying to give uh, the Roman church a little bit of a kick in the seat of the pants. You know, not unlike that 13-year-old boy who has discovered the couch and video games and, um, and Hot Pockets, and uh, just loving life. No job yet, no, you know, school's pretty easy, and once in a while, Mom has to come around with the spoon and clack him on the head and say, get up, go do something. And this is the gift that Paul is sort of trying to give to the Roman church. Get up, do something. 
You, have, you are one people, bound together by one spirit. You have one source, one God, and you all have the same task. You all have to work together at it. But there was one more problem, and that was there were Christians who were mature Christians, and there were Christians who were baby Christians. And so the expression of faith was much different. There were strong Christians who understood that it didn't really matter what you ate. They knew the teachings of Jesus, that Jesus taught us it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth. But there were some people who had just come to the Lord, and there were all of these religious trappings that they were still in the middle of trying to keep. All of the dietary restrictions, all of, all of the um, various cultural laws, even though they couldn't all come to an agreement on what those cultural laws were. Still, lots of Christians wrapped up in that. So Paul's going to start chapter 15, even though I preached this last week, this little bit, I'm going to just preach it again uh, so that we can finish out the chapter. He says in Romans chapter 15, verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The mature Christian has the obligation to make room for the sometimes arrogance and the miscommunications and the false beliefs that the baby believers have. They have to come in, they have to make room for that and very gently but firmly lead those younger believers along in the gospel and allow it to break down their immaturity and build them up. The strong have to do that. And verse 2, he says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. This is where I concluded last week. We have a rule in our church, as every church does, that our goal is not for self-promotion. It's not for me to look good. If I start a ministry, it's not so that I can be raised high by many mindless followers. It's... The reason that we're called to minister is to build other people up. Very many Christians have lost faith, have lost endurance, have walked away because uh, God had called them to a certain ministry and nobody cared, you know? And they thought, you know, I thought that once I started ministering, people would be like, whoa, you're amazing. But that's not what ministry is about. It's about building up other people. And Paul's encouraging the strong Christians, don't give up, don't. Bear with the weak. I know it's tough. I've done lots of it. But keep bearing with them. Keep building them up. Use that as your rule. Do what is good for the people who are around you, not what is good for you. Verse 3, Paul is now going to give the example of Jesus. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, and through endurance, and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And Paul's saying, look, 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 look at Jesus. Did Jesus come down and rally the troops and be like, guys, time to start, you know, lifting me high. My hour has come. No, but actually he did the opposite. He gathered people around and he said, are you hungry? Let me feed you. Do you need truth? Let me teach you truth. He was busy, busy, busy building other people up. And when the hour came for him to die, he gladly laid down his life because it was what God was calling him to do. And so Jesus is our Lord because God has raised him up. He is our example. He bore all of the reproaches that were supposed to be for us. The anger that people had towards God, Jesus bore. And that's what makes him our example. So Paul's pointing at Jesus and he's saying, look, look at all of the scripture and everything that was written about the Messiah, the coming Messiah. Jesus is him. Look at his example. Look at how he did it. You're one people. You're following one Lord, Jesus. Only him. He's the example for the slaves. He's the example for the Jewish Christians, for the Greek Christians, for the barbarian Christians. And in this day and age, the charismatic Christians, the Presbyterian Christians, the liturgical Christians, the traditional Christians, the Mennonite Christians, we all have one Lord, Jesus. Each and every one of us 
Each and every one of us from all of our different churches are looking at the same Lord as we should. But we should never lose hope. And so Paul puts an appeal here in verse number 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. (laughs) Paul, to give these people a gift, the gift of encouragement, he's trying to encourage them. The gift of endurance. He's trying to get them to not give up, to stand firm, to keep doing what they're supposed to do. So he appeals to the character of God. He says says this prayer right here. May the God of endurance and encouragement. And I think this is instructive. We serve a God who endures. We serve a God who does not change. We serve a God who does not give up. Christian, has God given up on you? No, he has not. All this time, God has not given up on you. God's still holding out hope for your redemption, for your ultimate redemption, not just your salvation, but even the redemption of your body for all of eternity. God has endured. God has endured everything that you have thrown at him. And believe me, you'll throw at him more. He's endured through your sin. He's endured through your selfishness. He has endured through your anger. God is still standing there. He's endured it all, and he's still welcoming you, and he's still encouraging. God is still saying, my child, he's not disowned you. God loves you. And God, he is the God of endurance, the God of encouragement. And so Paul is praying that this God, would grant you and me to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. So the picture is, we've all got our eyes on Jesus, and God, the source, is putting into us endurance. He's putting into us encouragement, and that enables us, all with our eyes on Christ, to move in harmony with one another. Like dancing, if you have everybody in the room and they've all got headphones on, and they're all listening to different music, will it be possible for them to all get in rhythm and dance together? No, it's impossible. We have to be listening to the same music. And then we can all be in rhythm. And some people dance a little bit goofier than other people, right? But we'll all be in rhythm together. And Paul is saying this is possible. This is possible through the God of endurance and encouragement. That in accordance with Jesus Christ, we, with one voice, would glorify God and our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So our posture to one another, if we're going to receive this gift from the apostle, it's not only to have our eyes on, on the one source, but it's to have our arms open to one another. There are, like I said last week, there are just... Too many Christians who are dying, who cannot endure because they're not linked arm in arm with other Christians. There's too many people who believe that a private faith between them and God is enough to make it through to the end. And Jesus says, that's not true. You can't go it alone. I have given you the gift, the gift of one another. It's the inheritance of the saints. Pick up your down payment. Pick up the the cash advance on your redemption. Join. Be a part of the church. Be a part of the body of believers, the universal body of believers. And so welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now, Paul is going to change gears just a little bit. He's talking about the same thing but he's going to say it differently. Starting in verse 8, he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might receive glor- might glorify God for his mercy. So this is Paul's point. He's saying, put your eyes back on Christ. He's just going to say it a little bit differently, that Christ was on a mission from God to, to do these things to show that God is truthful, that he doesn't lie, that the things that he has promised to the patriarchs through time would come true, 
and that everybody, everybody would be united together underneath his banner. Then he's going to prove it from the Old Testament. He says, as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. So Paul is talking to the Romans about why they're allowed to be a part of the people of God. It was Jesus, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, true. But he came for everybody. He welcomed everybody, and he died for everybody. And now his kingdom knows no end, no boundary. We all belong together in the same family. Or else what were these scriptures talking about when they included the Gentiles? So of course they do. Now watch this. Paul stops, and he turns back and says another prayer over the Roman church. Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The reason that Paul is stopping, he's, he's making a point, stopping and praying over them, and when he does, he appeals to the character of God because that is our source. We have only one source, and it is the living God. He is alive, he is not dead, and he is the God of hope. God is standing in his throne room, and his heart is bursting with hope. You didn't invent hope. You didn't invent hope. God invented it. And way back when all of creation was infected with sin and humans had been bamboozled by the effect of sin and they were transformed into these pure creatures, into creatures who had sin living inside of them. It was God who stood firm and endured for our sakes. It was God who showed up in the garden and encouraged those people because he is the God of endurance, he is the God of encouragement, and he's the God of hope. And too many Christians have lost their hope. Too many Christians are looking around at all of the circumstances and all of the things that have come against them, and they have said, where is my hope? Put your eyes on Jesus Christ, your Lord. He is the source of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And not only is he the God of hope, but when he starts pouring, when his spirit gets turned on, poured into you. You get full of joy. The word here in the Greek is kara. And it means gladness. It means like a smile, like more than a smile. You know when you start, something's funny to you and it starts with a smile and then starts bubbling into something more? till all of a sudden you're just, you're just laughing, you're just kind of beside yourself, and you've just got to take a break from life and just let it out and laugh and be like, that's so funny. Ah, okay, that is joy. That is joy. And that's what God is trying to fill you with in the Holy Spirit, with joy and peace. And this word peace means tranquility, not just the absence of war. It means that too, the absence of conflict. But it is a positive, proactive word in which a person is radiating a stillness. And it is a stillness that is hopeful. It has a smile. This God of hope is filling you by the power of the Holy Spirit with joy and peace. That joy that, that the Spirit is doing inside of you, that peace that the Spirit is working inside of you, um, is a power that enables us to hope. God's hope seems to not be just directly transferred. God seems to pour out in his hope. He's pouring into us his spirit. That spirit is working in us joy and peace. And in that joy and peace, we hope. Do you see sort of the connection there? And so... Uh, the point of instruction here uh, for you, that I have to you, what I want to preach at you for a minute, is that the Spirit of God has joy and peace available to you. 
And we have to open up our hearts and open up our hands and say, yes, please. And God will be faithful to put his spirit inside of you. And so if you are not a believer, the first step is you have to say, I receive God's endurance towards me, his encouragement towards me to receive his forgiveness, for that was Christ's primary mission. We receive our forgiveness for sins, and then we say, Lord, the Spirit. And God sends into us the very character of Jesus Christ, the, the very ghost of God's holiness. It comes inside of us and begins a work, and that work is joy and peace. Look, the limit to how much joy you can have and how much peace you can have in the Spirit of God is not on God's end, it's on your end. So if you are sitting here this morning say, that sounds nice, I would like some joy, I would like some peace, then you need the Spirit of God and all you have to do is ask for Him and receive Him. So after this prayer, Paul is going to... Um, um, give another encouragement. He's saying the same thing, but just differently. He says, I myself am satisfied about you, brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. This is like Paul realizes that what he has just said sounds a bit corrective. So he's acting sort of like the cop who pulls someone over on the highway who wasn't breaking any laws and walks up to the car like, is there a problem? Opposite? No, no, no. You're good. I just want to tell you some things. You know, the road's icy ahead. That kind of thing. So I, he's saying, I'm satisfied about what you guys are doing. I've heard about what you guys are doing, that you're full of goodness, that you're filled with knowledge, that you're able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul is appealing to his role in the church. And each and every one of us should know what our role is, what the Spirit is doing inside of us that enables us to build up other people. Paul's saying, it's not because you guys are in error that I'm writing. I'm encouraging you to do these things because God wants me to encourage you. That's my job. Just bear with me. Let me throw my arms around you and hug on you and love on you and encourage you on your way. Don't take it as like, whoa, Paul thinks we're doing something wrong. No, 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 no. Just this is what God has called me to do. I'm a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles so that when the Gentiles, when you and me bring our offerings to God, they are sanctified. They're acceptable to the Lord. That's Paul's job. That's the, what the gospel does. Verse 17, in Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed by the power of signs and wonders, so that the power of the Spirit of God, excuse me, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Paul is painting a picture for them that they need to pay attention to, that his work, his job as a leader in the church is to spread the kingdom. Just like Jesus said we should pray in our daily prayers, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what Paul is doing. He's going around spreading the gospel. He's helping the Gentiles to be included into the church. He's showing them how they can be filled with the Spirit and by power, by signs, by wonders to be included in what God is doing. It started at Jerusalem and now it's going all around. It's getting bigger and bigger. Verse 20, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Here Paul believes what we here at the adopted church believe. We don't want to grow our church by having a bunch of unsatisfied Christians finding some people who are doing church better than the other churches around. No, we want people who don't know Jesus to know Jesus. 
We want the darkness to become light. We don't want to build on somebody else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him, that's who we want to tell. Those who have never understood, that's who we want to understand. And so we, with, with the spirit of Jesus Christ and with the blessing of Paul, are going forward into all this world to tell people about Jesus. And telling people about Jesus is not just saying, have you been forgiven yet? Hey, let me tell you about this gift. You should probably seek forgiveness so that on judgment day, you're good to go. But rather it's to say, there is a group of people to which you should belong. The people who are called by Jesus' name. The people who have been redeemed, who have been forgiven, who are on his team, under his leadership, I invite you to join me. Follow me as I follow Christ. And our world is so desperately hungry for the truth, for real power, for real truth, for real love. Not the fake stuff, but the real stuff, not gimmicks but the true power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, Paul's going to explain why it's been, if this is his job and he needs to really be doing it, why he hasn't come to them yet, because it's been some time. And so verse 22, he says, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions. And since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So he's saying, here's the reason that I haven't come to you. I have really wanted to come to you. You guys are important. You've been on my heart. I've been praying for you. But I've been doing all this ministry, and now I've preached the gospel in all of these regions, so it's about time that I made it to Rome. In fact, I think God's calling me to the edge of the known world, which was Spain, all the way over there. And so I'll pass right by you guys, but right now I've been given a lot of money by the churches here for those who are being oppressed in Jerusalem. And that was where the persecution really started. Uh, in church history uh, was at Jerusalem for the Christians. So Paul was heading into the fire, as it were, with some help, with some aid for the Christians who were persecuted. And of course, we share this heart with Paul. We care desperately for the persecuted church. And that's a good reason for him not coming to Rome, right, to help out the persecuted church. But then he is going to give one last appeal and one last prayer. Verse 30. Oh, very last thing. Uh, he's saying, uh, read verse 29 with me. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Paul's hope here, uh, no, not his hope, his faith, his confidence, is that he's been held up by the will of God. It, it's not time yet. That's why I'm writing this letter. But when I come, um, it will be the perfect time for me to arrive and be fully employed to help you. Verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Paul is just so right on here. Though they're separated by culture, though they are separated by geography and distance, though they are separated probably doctrinally, because Romans has a ton of doctrine in it, so Paul's trying to teach them something that, that they don't hold to yet. Yet, Paul is saying, we are bound together, we are bound together, and you owe me. You owe me your prayers. And church, I, I'm here to tell you, like, i totally with Paul on this one. And I'll say the same thing to you. You owe me. You owe me your prayers. 
you should be bound together with, with me personally and I with you personally. We should be bound together. We should know what we should be praying about for each other. We owe that to each other. You can't be one people if you don't even know what to pray for someone else. And so Paul is saying, like, you owe me your prayers. You've got to pray with me. Strive together. Fight with me. Get in the battle. Get on your knees and ask God. Fight against the powers of darkness with me by praying that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So he's saying, I've got this one last test before I can come to Rome, and I've got, there's some real trouble that I might get in. I need you to help me by praying for me. Please pray for me. Now, he'll lastly appeal to God's character. Verse 33, he says, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. All of this stuff together, as Paul is trying to take the spoon and whack him on the head and say, come on, guys, you've got to do something. As he's trying to encourage them and give them a gift, he is so right on to simply talk about how amazing God is and who God is. That's the greatest encouragement. And I was, as I was praying about how I was supposed to close this sermon, I, I told the Lord, like, I do feel like the highway cop, like I'm going to be pulling over my own people and being like, get up and do, these people are doing all kinds of stuff, you know? I, I, I don't have that against my church. My church is busy working, busy praying. And God said, encourage them. They, they don't need to be corrected. They need to be encouraged. Adopted church, we serve the God of encouragement. You may be tired and you may be weary, but he is not. It may be hard for you to endure. You may be going through some things that feels like it's going to tear you apart, but it won't tear him apart, and he will never leave you. God is so good. God loves you so much. Don't give up. Whatever God has called you to, whatever difficulty you're walking through, and I know most of you, and I know you're walking through stuff, don't give up. God, may God encourage you. May he bless you. May he keep you. May you be full of joy and peace as you just stick to it. Grind it out. Stand for the truth. Love your neighbor. Keep on keeping on. Adopted church, God will not forsake you. He will use you. He will use you to push back the darkness to march into the territory of the enemy, to storm the gates of hell, to rescue people and to bring them along. You may feel like you are a solitary, lonely being who's grasping, God, what do you want me to do? May he put people's cloaks in your hand that you could pull them to you and say, follow me as I follow Christ. May the God of peace be with you all, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, it's, it is with pleasure that we um, gaze upon your countenance. Metaphorically, of course, right now, but there's coming a day when we will see you face to face. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the end, I will stand on the earth and I will see him. I will behold him face to face Though my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see the Lord. We hold to that hope. We hold to your hope. We ask that you would send your spirit to fill us with joy and with peace. With that kind of bubbling and infectious tranquility. God, I pray for those people right now who are sitting here who are caught in sin. Break the chains of their sin, Lord. Remind them that you love them. Remind them that there is nothing that they can do to outlast you. Remind them of your forgiveness and your hope, your plans for them. Woo them with your grace. God, for those who are sitting here who are 
distracted and discouraged and beaten down, I pray Your Spirit into them, Father. That the Spirit of all hope and peace would uh, inspire them, inhabit them, inflate them, that they might be brought back to their feet to stand with You. Jesus, bind us together in the spirit of prayer. Cause us to believe that we owe one another our prayers. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.